Happy Halloween and welcome to Sect Z. You're with us now on part two of Contemporary Satanism as we cover the Satanic Panic. I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albaney. And I guess before we jump into the topics at hand for today, uh, I first want to apologize for being the main reason that this episode has been so long in production. Uh, A couple weeks ago, I was presenting at a conference, the American Society for Ethno-History Conference in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. So being out of the country for about half a week and then having to come back and sort of get caught back up on all my grad school responsibilities uh, through the podcast in a bit of disarray, but uh, we will be updating the schedule on our next State of the Podcast blog post that we'll be releasing on our website, sexed.com. And of course, uh, I suppose the last thing to keep you updated about is the campaign we've been a part of all month. So uh, hopefully you've been following along with uh, hashtag two pods a day. That's hashtag two pods a day, which is a social media campaign uh, we've been a part of that is helping to promote independent podcasts much like us. So uh, it ends on Halloween, October 31st today. Um, So you can go on Facebook, Twitter, whatever social media platform you're on, follow that hashtag, and you can hopefully discover some new podcasts that you enjoy like ours. Do you want to just keep going? Because there's a lot of parts that I'm just going to expand on, so I think you should do a lot of the reading. Sure. So If you want to switch, just poke at me, and I'll Instead of having names. Sure. (laughs) Um, We'll do it Quaker style. Yeah. Um, So with that, why don't we go ahead and get into today's subject at hand. When we last left off uh, with the Church of Satan, founded by Anton LaVey, it was not in great shape. It was the mid-1970s, and largely thanks to LaVey himself, the Church of Satan had started to fracture into countless little splinter groups, with the grottos or affiliated churches in Detroit, New York, and several other major cities being disbanded and then reformed. The splintering into various local factions was in part a predictable effect of Levian Satanism's emphasis on individuality, social Darwinism, and the constant rejection of the so-called herd mentality. According to the Church of Satan's own account of their history, this collapse was a good thing, as the original vision for Satanism that LeVay had was for small groups of elites, uh, preferably people who were rich and famous, which does fit in with what we know about his lifelong obsession with celebrities. The success of the Satanic Bible certainly did draw in a lot of new Satanists, and LeVay claimed to be uncomfortable with the growing herd mentality and lack of subtlety for many of the new recruits. Though, if you've seen or read literally anything LeVay has done, you might be surprised that he even knew the word subtlety. As we've seen from people like Michael Aquino, though, There was also pushback against LeVay from strong-minded individualists who were, like any good Satanists, uh, had no desire to just be followers of LeVay, particularly once LeVay started charging money from his followers. A a move which gave him the smaller organizations he wanted got potential rivals out of his uh, lack of hair and, of course, earned him more money, which was always on LeVay's list of priorities. One of the last factors that influenced the collapse of the first large-scale satanic religion also seems to be that LeVay just got a bit fed up with the whole thing. And we, for one, don't blame him. Serving as the high priest of Satan required a whole lot of time and effort, and as time went on, LeVay just started to seem almost bored by the repetitive nature of his satanic career. Well, early on, LeVay had been pretty gleeful about arguing with any devout Christian who wanted to argue with him. These arguments, year after year after year, got incredibly tiring. So LeVay uh, had basically just been repeating ad nauseum the standard Satanist disclaimers against against Christian misconceptions, saying things like, no, Satanists don't perform human sacrifice, no, we don't actually believe in Satan, and so on. So it was a good thing that his now adult daughters, Zena and Carla, had stepped up to leadership positions in the church, because in 1980, a book was published that would catalyze a massive public reaction against Satanism in the United States, and the Church of Satan would be caught right up in the hysteria. The book was called Michelle Remembers, and was co-authored by Canadian psychiatrist Lawrence Pazder with his patient Michelle Smith, and it was claimed to be an autobiography of Smith. 
While Smith was Pazder's patient, they worked extensively on hypnotherapy to recover repressed memories from Smith's childhood, and they also had an affair which ended with both of them leaving their spouses to marry each other. Smith revealed in the book that she'd been subjected to extensive and gruesome tortures and sexual assault as a child by her parents, who were members of the Church of Satan, which she described as a massive hidden conspiracy that was constantly performing human sacrifices. The memories recovered from their hypnosis sessions ended up being the bulk of the book, which is unfortunate because recovering lost memories of trauma through hypnotherapy is not actually something that hypnosis does. Um, one of the main things about hypnosis is that it puts patients into a highly suggestible and disassociative state. Uh, when someone's under hypnosis, they're in the active process of creating new memories. It's, sim more, it's more similar to dreaming than remembering actual events. Uh, in addition to having a now discredited pseudoscience at its core, Many of the claims in Michelle Remembers are objectively untrue. The book takes place in the 1950s, for example, during which time the Church of Satan was still about a decade away from being founded. Essentially, there's no proof whatsoever to verify anything that Michelle quote-unquote remembered. Uh, and then there's parts in the book where, for example, she's kidnapped for several months. All of her school records show she never missed any school during that time. Uh, her family in the book has almost no resemblance to her actual family. Uh, she claimed to not have any siblings, for example, which uh, her actual siblings objected to. Um, and her parents' um, remarriages and deaths were never mentioned. The book also ends uh, with what I think is probably the most egregious thing, an angel showing up and magically healing all of her scars and conveniently erasing any physical evidence that could verify any of her claims. This sort of conspiracy theory angle was an, was an early example of the thinking that would really take off in the information age, uh, taking an extreme story with almost no actual information or evidence and then turning the lack of verifiability into something that then strengthens uh, the belief of a conspiracy. To believers in this kind of conspiracy, the fact that all the records and testimony that we have from schools, witnesses, family members, law enforcement, medical professionals, and even basic common sense all prove her story completely untrue, is held up by them as evidence that the conspiracy is real because the records have all, of course, been altered by this so-called satanic conspiracy. So it, it turns into this weird sort of backwards thing where the less evidence there is, the more they believe it. Well, the book itself is mostly just a lurid string of torture scenes and uh, demon attacks, some of which were lifted pretty much directly from movies like The Exorcist. It also managed to tap into some racist fears as well, with the author Pazder claiming that the Church of Satan was linked to West African secret religious societies and that because of that connection, they were all now cannibals. Now, we might end up doing an episode on actual West African secret societies, which do exist, and it's an incredibly diverse topic covering a lot of different groups. Uh, I've done one small research project looking into the history of one specific West African secret society, and all, basically all I got was that it's way more complicated than I think we'll be able to deal with um, easily. It's going to be very difficult to describe them fairly and accurately. But that concern is something that Pazder uh, never really even crossed his mind, so he just immediately went for the they're all Satanist cannibals angle. Following the publication of Michelle Remembers, Pazder set himself up as a self-proclaimed expert on satanic ritual abuse and immediately began to make money using his status as the authority on the topic uh, he just made up. A uh, move that's both very much like what Anton LaVey would do and very much in the spirit of the 1980s. While LaVey himself was no stranger to making up absurd stories about people he never met, the Church of Satan did not take kindly to the accusations against them in Michelle Remembers, and LaVey threatened to sue, prompting Pazder to make a statement that the book was about some other unrelated secret group of Satanists. Due to the splintering of the Church of Satan, which had already happened, there were plenty of other unaffiliated folks out there who had started using the Satanist label. In particular, there were waves of new Satanists who had never met LaVey, who simply bought the Satanic Bible, read it, liked it, and started calling themselves Satanists, without affiliating with any sect and just acting as lone wolf Ayn Randian individualists. That's sort of the standard Satanist these days, as we're going to see later on. That's what the vast majority of them uh, are. In spite of being frankly absurd, Michelle Remembers is seen as one of the early sparks for what became known as the Satanic Panic. As the 1980s dragged on, fears about a secret conspiracy of Satanists abusing children took off particularly among the growing evangelical and fundamentalist sects. Following Michelle Remembers, other individuals also started to recover lost memories of being abused in their childhood by a satanic cult. 
feeding into the satanic panic were also the fact that real cases of children being sexually abused were starting to gain more attention and be discussed as a problem. While the vast majority of child abuse is committed by family members or close family friends, this truth was difficult for many people to face at the time, and blaming a secret conspiracy of Satanists for everything was, in many ways, easier. I feel like I should mention the, the Catholic Church when it comes to child uh, sexual abuse with that whole scandal, but also... It's, uh, like a lot of things, a tough topic to address, and I'd also like to point out that it's uh, not so much any one religion is the uh, indicator of who's going to do these things. It's are they in a trusted position, are they a close family friend, or are they someone like a priest or a pastor um, who people will leave their child alone with is, is the number one factor, and they're found, people like this, in every single religion, essentially every major religion. Yeah, and when, and did, the, when did the actual big bubble burst much because, later yeah um so this actually this is one of the big uh, real world impacts of the satanic panic uh, along with the other things we're going to cover is that it was a huge setback in terms of actually getting perpetrators of this crime to kind of assault because it created an image that was nothing like what the people who actually did these things are it created oh of course our family would never be involved in that it was some outside force or it would be if a family member is involved it's because this satanic cult has brainwashed them or whatnot and so it really tied up a massive amount of resources including you know advocates and professionals who should have been working on the problem in a more effective way to just chase these conspiracy theories and so yeah it, it, it does tie into that but i didn't really i hadn't really thought through how to address that in a well it's definitely careful a, way here yeah of of all of the topics that you need to tread carefully around yeah um that certainly one of the big ones. While Michelle remembers scared a lot of people and got the satanic panic started, the McMartin preschool trial really showed the impact that the satanic panic had on America. The, the McMartin preschool trial, uh, from accusations to, spoiler alert, acquittal, began in 1984 and ended in 1990, and involved the McMartin family and other workers at the preschool being charged with over 300 horrific crimes against the children in the preschool, based entirely on the eyewitness testimony of preschool-aged children, one seriously mentally ill parent with substance abuse issues, and a jailhouse witness who had already been convicted multiple times of perjury in other trials. The trial had some particularly outlandish and bizarre accusations, including accusations that the preschool workers had a secret network of tunnels to smuggle children to various locations, tunnels which a massive and expensive police search found no evidence of whatsoever, uh, the actor Chuck Norris was also alleged to be one of the satanic abusers, and witnesses claimed that the satanic preschool staff uh, abducted children using hot air balloons, which seems unnecessary because other witnesses also claimed that the staff members could fly on their own thanks to the magic powers of Satan. In spite of these claims, which seem on the surface ridiculous, the mass media was largely supportive of the accusers uh, during the lengthy trial and failed to question the validity of the accusations. So this claim that's being made in Michelle Remembers of miraculous healing of wounds sort of being accepted, uh, you kind of see something reminiscent of that in the publication of books these days from uh, children who have gone through uh, near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. um, I won't name any of them, but you can probably think of one off the top of your head of like a child who apparently dies and uh, goes to heaven and comes back, and it's sort of this uh, miraculous journey that's accepted as uh, true by many who read it, even though uh, there's one in particular where the child who is... Uh, at the center of the story claims later that he fabricated it or parts of it were fabricated especially in this case where you have preschoolers who are called to actually make accusations parroting off the sort of speculations that their parents were thinking of and in doing so in not understanding the ramifications of their actions because they're children they exacerbate the whole hysteria and then, yeah, especially um, the satanic conspiracy angle, it really got boosted with the fact that uh, our friend Lawrence Pastor showed up, the psychiatrist author of Michelle Remembers. He was brought into the trial as a consultant 
Um, again, just uh, that's his career now. He's the expert in satanic ritual abuse. Um, using his self-appointed status, he unsurprisingly made the claim that the McMartins were involved with the same cons- satanic conspiracy that he wrote about. Uh, and again, his total lack of any verifiable evidence was seen by believers as evidence in and of itself. Uh, in the end, the McMartin trial proved to be the longest and most expensive trial in U.S. history, with over $15 million of taxpayer money being spent on things like ruining the lives of the accused who lost their business and were in prison for much of the 80s before their eventual acquittal. Uh, 1985 was probably the height of the anti-Satanist hysteria in America. Uh, as the McMartin preschool trial continued to slowly drag on, uh, daytime talk shows and the news media were all over this case uh, and really eager to fill their ever-increasing uh, airtime with Satanist controversies. Anton LaVey, for once, though, was done seeking media attention, and this was when his daughter, uh, particularly Zena, would step up in response, uh, specifically to a 2020 episode that was uh, trying to tie the McMartin trial to the Church of Satan, which, as you'll recall, had, had splintered and was at that point a very small and mostly inactive sect. Uh, in an interview given in 2011, uh, Zena describes what, happens ne- what happened next. Quote, In 1985, a U.S. news show called 2020 accused the Satanic Bible of being responsible for the the child daycare Satanic ritual abuse, allegations which were new then. I called my father and asked him what his media strategy would be to deal with this catastrophe. Nothing. He didn't care. As far as he was concerned, it didn't concern him. It wasn't anything he needed to worry about. He certainly wasn't going out in public to do anything about it. He admitted that many media sources had already contacted him, and he was just going to ignore it until it went away. I tried to convince him that this would only get worse if he didn't respond, and that he really needed to get someone to answer calls quickly or be taken as an admission of guilt or suspicion. Finally, he admitted he had no one to deal with interviews or media. I offered to help temporarily until he found someone. This was not what I'd intended to do with my life. I had other plans. Zena was given the title of High Priestess, uh, in spite of her intention, ended up spending most of the 1980s defending Satanism from increasingly outlandish accusations and trying to put out some of the flames of the Satanic Panic. Along with her sister Carla, they appeared on The Phil Donahue Show, Entertainment Tonight, uh, Secrets and Mysteries, and The Sally Sally Jesse Raphael Show, and other iconically terrible 1990s talk shows. Um, Often debating on these shows against other religious leaders, their media presence did a lot to revive the flagging public interest in the Church of Satan, and so a new generation of Satanists for the 90s were introduced to the Satanic Bible and LaVey's later works, uh, like The Satanic Witch. While all this uh, 80s media frenzy certainly boosted the number of Satanist converts for decades to come, the Church of Satan itself wasn't affiliated with the vast majority of these new converts, Uh, and they mostly were, as we uh, mentioned before, either starting their own local sects or just becoming individual Satanists. It's one person with a Satanic Bible that they like, and that's it. As the media attention given to Satanists grew, two serial killers would throw fuel onto the flames. Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, went on a brutal killing spree which started in April 1984 and ended in August of 1985. About about halfway through his killing spree, Ramirez began to incorporate satanic imagery into his crimes, believing that his many escapes and close calls with the police were the result of being protected by Satan. While Ramirez certainly read the Satanic Bible, he was not a Levian Satanist or a member of the Church of Satan. According to Ramirez and Anton LaVey, Ramirez did attend one Satanic gathering but was shy, did not get along with anyone there, and did not return. After Ramirez was arrested, it became clear that he believed in a theistic Satan. He had been raised in a very religious Roman Catholic household, and his parents and family members often talked about Satan and various demons having very real concrete powers that could impact the real world. His conception of Satan seems to be rooted much more deeply in the Roman Catholic version of Satan than the Levian one. But again, the distinction was largely lost on the public, and Ramirez, during his late 80s trial, would frequently reference Satan, uh, though the public fear of Satanism was already on its way out of style by this time. It's also highly likely that Ramirez, who obviously loved all the media attention and fear that his crimes attracted, was deliberately using Satanism in order to get more publicity for himself. Uh, Another serial killer that uh, sort of injected himself into the satanic panic was Henry Lee Lucas, who might not actually be a serial killer. He seems to be more of a serial false confessor, um, as he confessed, I think, more than 3,000 crimes that were just... Uh, essentially, he just wanted cigarettes and coffee, which they had in the interrogation room. So he would 
confess to every single crime that he heard about. Um, but in 1985, he ended up uh, working with Max Call, uh, who is a born again Christian uh, and former pornography writer. Um, to write a book called The Hand of Death, in which Henry Lee Lucas claims that all of uh, his murders that he had falsely confessed to were part of a massive satanic uh, cover-up conspiracy. Uh, again, adding just a little bit of uh, feeding into the media attention and feeding off of it in some ways. The satanic panic also had a local impact on a lot of local law enforcement who were at a complete loss to understand what was going on. Um, Oftentimes, people who believed in these conspiracies uh, and you know sacrifice uh, accusations would um, come to the police with, "Oh, I think Satanists are doing this. Oh, I think Satanists are doing that." There's a whole range of amazing um, police training videos for how to deal with Satanists, which will include the links to uh, in the show notes because some of them are on YouTube and, and spectacularly uh, misguided. <laughs> There's a lot of. Um, essentially someone who's just read the satanic bible once and then immediately claims themselves to be an expert on satanism and uh, again capitalizes off of that they'll be they'll work for the police they'll be starring in these videos and it's it's quite clear that none of these videos have any even connection to each other it's it's always just these lone local con artists essentially <laughs> coming up with their own spin uh, on what satanism is and then local police agencies are operating and uh, trying to solve actual crimes using that, which uh, was not helpful at all. Um, there was also the uh, sort of phenomenon of pseudo-Satanism, which as fears were so prevalent and just the social fears of Satanism and what's, you know, the, the conception of this conspiracy um, was so large that criminals would use those fears and claim to be related to it uh, specifically to intimidate or silence their victims which did occur a couple of times um, in connection with actual crimes, which, again, Richard Ramirez was probably the biggest one, where um, his Satanism was a bit more complicated than most cases of uh, pseudo-Satanism because he did actually believe in Satan, but in most of the cases there are you know things like uh, crime lords or local drug dealers who will use Satanic imagery to scare rivals, uh, essentially. Um, but by the 90s, as the McMartin preschool trial wrapped up and people started to realize how ridiculous it all was, the satanic panic really started to fade out. And then again, as we see with a lot of the new religious movements we've covered that started in the 60s and 70s, um, like Discordia, they take on a new life uh, once the internet comes around. Now, you mentioned lots of local responses to the uh, satanic panic, but I think we'd also be remiss if we didn't uh, consider some of the national consequences of all this, because uh, one that especially comes to mind is what's going on with what's known as the Parents Music Resource Center. So basically, this is a committee that is formed in 1985, so it's forming in tandem uh, with the preschool trial, right? And probably if there's any single figure who's most associated with this group, it's probably Tipper Gore, Al Gore's wife, who consequently, uh, the very first political event I ever attended was when I was quite young. Um, my This was something that my my parents took me to, it was a rally for Al Gore, who was running for president in 2000, only it was Tipper Gore speaking. It was a very surreal experience because they passed out gourds to everyone, um, and you were supposed to like hang, like uh, raise up the gourd, because uh, gourd kind of sounds like gore. Um, but uh, basically, this group uh, is responsible for uh, lobbying uh, against what they considered to be uh, negative influences in music. And they put out what's called the Filthy 15, which is a list of songs that they find most objectionable. And um, there are lots of reasons that these songs could be considered objectionable. Uh, Darling Nikki from Prince uh, for lyrical content that is evocative of sex and masturbation. Uh, of course, you have Judas Priest, Motley Crue, Twisted Sister, all of the uh, hair metal bands that are coming out in the 80s. But then you have some songs uh, like Into the Coven by Merciful Fate and Possessed by Venom. The reason they're on there? For occult references. So uh, this sort of fear of the occult, which is 
indelibly tied into the growth of Satanism at the time. It's influencing what's going on in Washington, D.C., as well as any town USA. Fascinating to watch these interviews from the 90s with um, with Zena and Carla LaVey. Uh, and again, we'll provide some links because a lot of those are now on YouTube as well. Um, or, or even the links of uh, Richard Ramirez interviewing from prison. Um, when they talk about Satanism, essentially every single person talking about Satanism is talking about a completely different thing. Um, you know, in these so-called conversations, it's like none of them are even on the same plane of what they're talking about because there are just so many personal assumptions that are uh, attached to just the word Satanism. Um, And they definitely don't accomplish anything uh, in the interviews other than getting a lot of uh, free publicity for both uh, the various Christian churches debating against them and for the Church of Satan. Well, you mentioned the Phil Donahue show is one of these shows that... um, uh, Anton LaVey's daughter is on. This is the same Phil Donahue who runs the Catholic League, right? Yeah. So even though you mention uh, that this is a movement that is at its apex, like in the years following the Church of Satan's really dispersion and uh, spread into sort of smaller groups, it's something that like hasn't entirely gone away, I would say, because every there couple of years are. there are these sort of echoes of the satanic panic. Uh, you you see this with things like uh, when Pokemon was very popular in the early 2000s and accusations that, uh, that cards would be, uh, they're basically evocative of demons and the devil. Yeah, I do remember... Uh... When I was in high school, I had a Magic the Gathering card that was banned because it had a pentagram on it. You especially see this, too, in sort of cultural critics who um, try to pin satanic and demonic influences in, like, certain media. There's a particular... uh, video series which i think we should also link to in the show notes this is going to be a very robust show notes i think there's a Um, lot of great stuff on youtube i just yeah (laughs) yeah um but basically criticizing the cartoons of the 1980s like uh you'd see uh, a guy holding a skeletor action figure and you know your your children are watching a show where there's an evil or there's a skeleton on it completely missing the point that skeleton is the bad guy that's not the character your child is supposed to be associated don't let your child see their own x-rays either (laughs) i mean (laughs) the uh church of satan itself does still exist today they are still active Um, not uh quite the the force they once were so levey uh anton levey himself died in 1997 um, and his uh then partner blanche barton became uh, embroiled in a legal argument with his, his children over his will and who would get uh, the black house, sort of the, the hub of Satanism. And it was uh, quite a large argument that the family uh, essentially splintered over that. There were claims that are, uh, again, completely un- unsubstantiated uh, surrounding Anton LaVey's death that he uh, repented and converted to whatever form of Christianity the people making the claims uh, are in favor of uh, on his deathbed, but that's completely unsubstantiated. Um, nobody was with him when he died, so there's no way to prove that and there's just a lot of people claiming uh, you know taking that uh, that constant back and forth argument that they've had uh, for so long next uh, to the next life is the black house still up the black house uh was torn down there was an unsuccessful bid to save it and it ended up getting sort of lost in the legal uh scuffle between his family that would make a great historic site it would have been so cool but it's gone and it was actually it was uh Carla LeVay, who tried to save it, and she didn't quite raise enough funds. Mm. Um, Was this pre or post rise of internet crowdfunding? 2001. So it was, I don't know which ones were around, but if they were around, they weren't popular. This was likely early yeah. internet days before. And it was, um, again, there's pictures of it. It's hilarious. It's a, it's a black painted sort of normal suburban house in the middle of other suburban houses in San Francisco. But yeah, she lost it. Um, in the in the legal uh, battles, which which sort of tore the family apart, and then they all went on to found uh, their own versions of the Church of Satan. So the the official Church of Satan, um, as an organization legally, is now controlled. Uh, it's based in I believe New York. Yeah, it's based in New York City, um, and it's run by still um, 
LeVay's former partner, um, Blanche Barton, who is the high priestess. Carla LeVay started her own version, which they're both uh, pretty legitimately descended from it. They both have pretty uh, clear claims to, to leadership of the Church of Satan, but it's East Coast, West Coast branches at this point. With uh, It's called the First Church of Satan, uh, is Carla's, uh, that she's the high priestess of, and that's uh, in California. And then uh, Zena LeVay... No longer goes by Zena LeVay, so don't call her that. Uh, she's just Zena, one name now, uh, and she's a Berlin-based uh, artist, as I think we mentioned last episode. And she actually split uh, in 1990, before her father's death. She got really sick of being on all those talk shows. Uh, and she actually went off and joined uh, Temple of Set with Michael Aquino, and then split off from that to start a, I think it's called the, the Sethian Liberation Movement, which is a splinter church of the Temple of Set. The Sethian Liberation Movement, from what I've seen, I haven't looked into it as much, seems uh, dedicated to Old helping work. people like her, yeah, yeah. Who, who got drawn into things bigger than them from a young age. And with Xena no longer using the last name LeVay at all, uh, it's also part of her, part of her uh, deliberate estrangement from the rest of her family. There's a lot of uh, personal disputes going on with her and her sisters and her dad, and Zena's actually the source for um, a lot of what we know about which parts uh, Anton LeVay was lying about in his backstory. She was able to come in and uh, sort of dispel further myths about him, um, which she had been doing uh, on the talk show circuit earlier, but then she, after leaving uh, the Church of Satan, ended up dispelling other uh, myths about her dad, the ones that he was starting. So... Um, that's where we get a lot of our information on, of course, he didn't do this or that. Following Anton LaVey's death, his successors in the various satanic churches managed to adapt well to the internet, maintaining much of the same argumentative tone and satanic content from their talk show days, but taking it to new mediums such as Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. These successor groups are mostly still around today, with the Church of Satan currently under the leadership of Barton's successor, Peter Gilmore, who, appropriately enough, was from Hell's Kitchen in New York and was part of the push that relocated uh, Church of Satan HQ to New York from California. Well, these groups are still around and active. Uh, there is uh, still division as they're both trying to sort of claim the leadership position uh, as successors to LeVay as the only uh, official Church of Satan. But in 2013, a new Satanist sect arose, and this is a group based in Salem, Massachusetts, which is known as the Satanic Temple. While the Church of Satan under Gilmore and the First Church of Satan under Carla LeVay tend to defend their position as spokespeople for Satanism in general, the Satanic Temple uh, is usually the group you'll be hearing about these days if you're hearing about Satanists. Uh, they've gotten a very strong presence online, and the Satanic Temple uh, has also been featured in a lot of traditional broadcast media. The Satanic Temple was founded in 2013 by Lucian, Lucian Greaves, which is of course a great Satanic sounding name, but as with the founders uh, of many sects, it's not his real name. He also goes by Doug Messner, which uh, also might not be his real name. Uh, the real Satanic Temple founder, uh, he, he's known to be protective of himself and his privacy, uh, especially as he gets death threats from his online Satanic activism. And it's also rumored that multiple people have played Lucian Greaves, um, which isn't necessarily as important because it's not a group that has a central authoritarian leader uh, like LeVay trying to control everything. Uh, it's a group very much designed for the internet age. The Satanic Temple is characterized much more by a decentralized ideological activism than a let's go party at Anton LaVey's house structure that the Church of Satan had. But he is uh, probably from Detroit. Uh, there definitely uh, is a city that has a very strong uh, presence from originally LaVey going there and starting up a grotto of the Church of Satan, uh, and which now has uh, a very active chapter of the Satanic Temple as well. Well, agreeing with LeVay and Satanism's statements on Christian, well, agreeing with LeVay and Satanist statements on Christian hypocrisy and individualism, the Satanic Temple is a much more progressive organization, explicitly rejecting the social Darwinism that was so central to the Church of Satan, as well as rejecting the belief in magic or indeed anything they deem supernatural. The Satanic Temple, rather than being individuals out for their own individual betterment, uh, has a political and social activist mission. And while the Satanic Bible and the Nine Satanic Statements of LaVey are still often referenced or used by Satanic Temple members, uh, they have their own statements of beliefs, which are as follows. Uh, quote, One should strive to act with compassion and empathy towards all creatures in accordance with reason. The struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. One's body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone. 
The freedoms of others should be respected, including the freedom to offend. To willfully and unjustly encroach upon the freedoms of another is to forego your own. Beliefs should conform to our best scientific understanding of the world. We should take care never to distort scientific facts to fit our beliefs. People are fallible. If we make a mistake, we should do our best to rectify it and resolve any harm that may have been caused. Every tenant is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word, end quote. Um, as for what the Satanic Temple actually does, they're primarily active in countering what they view as religious encroachment uh, against the First Amendment and violations of separation of church and state. As, religious, as a religious organization which enshrines the concept of bodily inviolability as one of their core tenets, they're often in direct opposition to church groups lobbying around the pro-life, pro-choice debate. Uh, as laws that, res that restrict an individual's right to control over their own body violates their religious beliefs. Perhaps the most notable success was their uh, attention-grabbing Baphomet statue depicting a demon figure and some children, which they made as a challenge to the Ten Commandments statue being presented at an Oklahoma courthouse. This is something that uh, the Oklahoma Baphomet statue is probably the most prominent one, but it is certainly not the only Baphomet statue. Like, um, as the United States, uh, especially religious groups, seem to have a, uh, a real affinity for uh, enshrining the Ten Commandments at government buildings, courthouses, and such, uh, basically their counter is that they have just as much a right to place a statue of a demon as Christians would have a right, or Judeo-Christians rather, would have a right of placing the Ten Commandments. And especially, um, they do uh, talk a lot, especially Greaves in his uh, outreaches, um, talks a lot about the, the sort of the sectarian nature of the conflict, the, the sort of fallacy um, that just because one extremist Christian group is really loud about a particular thing, that doesn't even remotely mean that the whole religion believes this or that. Um, and is sort of trying to combat uh, specifically uh, far right-wing evangelical sects from speaking as though they're all of Christianity. Um, but uh, unlike the uh, Church of Satan, um, Satanic Temple really doesn't proselytize. They're, they're actively anti-proselytizing. <laughs> So they will counter if someone else is proselytizing, they will go there as well. If they're using public spaces or, or doing anything that the uh, Satanic Temple views as violating the First Amendment, but they have really no interest in convincing anyone that their worldview is correct. Um, they want to be seen as one valid worldview among many. But they uh, another uh, effort that they did recently, this is I think their most recent one, is their... Uh, after school Satan program, which was a response to a Supreme Court case which allowed Christian based good news clubs to evangelize to children using public school resources as, uh, in their after school programs. So, again, as their standard argument goes, if we're going to allow uh, specific interpretations and sects of Christianity to spread their specific beliefs uh, in schools, then it's legally framed as allowing any religion to, so they're going to get in there too and preach Satanism, essentially, if anyone is going to try and mess with the First Amendment in that way. And again, the After School Satan program is all about um, educating kids about the options and um, a sort of unindoctrinating um, what others indoctrinate people with is, is their whole real agenda. Um, a local thing that the Satanic Temple from Detroit uh, does that's near to us, Snaketivity. Uh, when there's a Lansing State Capitol nativity scene in December, uh, usually the Usually the Satanic Temple uh, from Detroit will set up the Snaketivity statue, which is a satanic serpent that uh, says, the greatest gift is the gift of knowledge. This is another quote from Lucian Greaves, which kind of encapsulates the general mission of the Satanic Temple. Quote, it is our goal to separate religion from superstition. Religion can and should be a metaphorical narrative construct by which we give meaning and direction to our lives and works. Our religion should not require of us that we submit ourselves to unreason and untenable supernatural beliefs based on literal interpretations of fanciful tales. Non-believers have just as much right to religion, and any exemptions and privileges being part of a religion brings as anybody else, end quote. And that's, I think, one of my favorite uh, 
statements that, that this group has made um, and gets to a point that I'm always uh, sort of fascinated with is, is the line between um, religion and superstition. Uh, I talked, I, I know, in earlier episodes about, you know, beliefs in ghosts or in, in beliefs in UFOs in our uh, uh, Heaven's Gate episode, that there are folk beliefs, there are superstitions, there are supernatural things that plenty of people believe in that have no basis in fact whatsoever um, that get tied into the metaphorical narrative construct uh, of a religion or maybe just are parallel to a religion. Um, And there doesn't seem to be very clear distinctions that people tend to make between the two. Um, And yeah, I think it's a extremely valid point that non-believers have just as much right to a religion as anybody that you don't need to believe by anyone's, you know, um, anyone's personal definition of religion doesn't make you a believer or non-believer if you think you are in one thing or not. And so the legal and practical benefits that, uh, essentially extremists demand, um, tend to come with their own strange baggage that is very unique to a particular sect. Um, so the, the idea of separating those two sort of streams of thought that religions often encompass both. This is what adds another layer of depth to this uh, case is the fact that um, the satanic temple is specifically looking at sort of religion as it is put into context with sort of American legal definitions of religion, not so much uh, just religion as a broader spiritual concept because again the satanic temple um, in its belief structure is very secular Um, i would go so far as to say this is an atheistic religion much like the church of satan right um yeah i mean it depends on this is this is stuff i love where it gets into your definition of atheist because it you know, means not believing in God, but that also you have to unpack what each individual person's definition of God is, and you're rarely going to find uh, two people who agree. So, um, essentially, it all comes down to personal interpretation. But the the idea that atheists can have a religion, um, absolutely, in my book, anyway. Um, but it's it's again, it's how you view or define religion, and again. Um, I think metaphorical narrative construct by which we give meaning and direction to our lives and works is a, a working definition of religion that, uh, yeah, I think um, and yet because covers a lot but doesn't cover everything, you know? And yet because atheism as a category doesn't have, uh, you know, the traditional elements of a religion in the sense that there's a church, there's a legal body, um, the satanic temple kind of gives those who... Uh, may not have a belief in the Christian God, may not have a belief in any gods, a, a, a outlet to still participate in religious conversations in the United States and have access to the same rights and privileges that religions would. And yeah, and definitely um, more, than, more than an atheist religion like um, Church of Satan, it makes me think of, uh, of Church of the Supreme Being and deism, where... You know, historically, you had all these people, you know, like Thomas Jefferson, or all, all tons of people um, throughout history who were nominally Christian, but um, had huge problems with uh, specifically the superstition, with believing in the supernatural, with believing things that pretty objectively are provable as impossible. The things like people flying around in the witchcraft, uh, uh, the preschool trial. No one, no one has the power to just fly around on their own. Um, but believing in that and believing in the religion are two completely different things that get linked. So the, the old deist sort of model of we're just going to believe in the social structures of this religion, we're going to use the language of religion, but we're not going to believe in the literal truth of any of the metaphors. Um, it's always been there, and this is just sort of codifying it, uh, as it's been codified before, but this is uh, for a specific goal uh for our time uh, quite specifically meanwhile uh, we can have nice fun things like giant snake statues that we put up for oh yeah they're lovely for the holidays yeah. so that that's our coverage of contemporary satanism there's a lot going on there's also a, a lot of splinter groups that we mentioned at least briefly um and i'm sure there's there's many more out there that we didn't uh including if you feel like starting your own you can do that by the end of the night so 
yeah, definitely um, let us know if you have any questions, comments, um, suggestions for future episodes. Thank you for listening. For Zach Said, I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albany, and of course, if you want to help support us here at Sex Ed, you can visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash sex ed. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, both at Sex Ed. And the best way that you can really help us out is that whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on, whether it be iTunes, whether it be Stitcher, just leave us a rating and review to help us grow and share Sex Ed with a friend or family member today. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is released under a Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at LEADER, the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed by Sex Ed do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.